Hello. Hi. How are you doing, sir? Okay. Uh, are you going to make a recording of this? Yes, I am. Good. Uh, so, I just found the message with your list of questions. Yes. So, let's start with what is DRM and whose rights are uh, the DRM trying to protect? Well, DRM as I consider it stands for Digital Restrictions Management. It stands for uh, system functionalities designed to restrict users in their use of uh, copies of works. It's an injustice. It is uh, a system of giving generally uh, the more powerful additional power over everyone else. They like to say that this is a matter of protecting rights, but it's really a matter of protecting power. That power is an injustice and it should not exist. I reject DRM. I have never used a system which had DRM because I refuse to use them. I'd rather have no access than live under the restrictions of DRM. What do you think of the Recording Industries Association of America's DMCA takedown notice that was sent to GitHub? I'm a fr oh, I couldn't hear all the words you said. I need to point out that I have hearing problems. And the problem is to recognize speech sounds in difficult situations. Now, speaking fast makes it more difficult, and having an accent that is unusual for me makes it more difficult. And there's probably some distortion in this line, which adds to it. The three together mean I have to struggle to figure out what you said. If you speak more slowly, it will be easier. All right. It's a peculiar thing. In the 1990s, when I was in India, I generally was able to hear and understand what Indians were saying. And after 2000, I discovered that it had become generally impossible for me to understand what Indians were saying. And I'm pretty sure there was no cho no general change in the way Indians spoke English. It had to be a change in my brain. Right. So I'll try speaking slowly. What oh, you and you need to speak a bit louder, or maybe I can make this. I'll I'll turn up my headphone volume. Could you speak again? Yeah. What do you think of the Recording Industries Association of America's DMCA takedown notice against YouTube DL? Oh, well, it was, as I understand it, it was uh, entirely, uh, entirely a distortion of the law, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation explained why that was so, and I believe that's why GitHub put it back up again. but I'm more concerned with the morality of it than the legality of it. Uh, and basically, it was a system of oppression. But that's what uh, the DMCA was mainly there to achieve, make it easier to repress. Why was the DMCA introduced? Well, of course, I don't know the motives. I can only try to guess. Uh, but in general, there are some the bad things in the DMCA give more power to uh, publishing companies and secondarily occasionally to authors and artists uh, to stop people from sharing. Now, that, that was visible here. It was to stop people from sharing YouTube DL. But in, 
the DRM portions of the DMCA were designed to uh, stop people from breaking the digital handcuffs that companies place on them. So before 1998, uh, companies tried implementing DRM and people who didn't like being handcuffed by DRM uh, implemented ways to break the handcuffs. The DRM, the, the, the DMCA made that much more difficult and uh, it's been followed by hardware design to restrict the people who use it the people who supposedly buy it are forbidden to change the parts of it that are designed to restrict them. Is the existence of DRM necessary for the DMCA to serve its purpose? Well, if the purpose is to repress, then yes, the DMCA, part of the DMCA, because the DMCA does many, says many different things. So there are two parts of the DMCA that are pertinent here. There's the part that uh, sets up the takedown system, and there is the part that uh, that, um, and then there's the part about DRM and forbidding the distribution of things that can of any equipment to break DRM. Uh, so you you better say which one you mean, because there's so much else in the DMCA. Uh, the large goal of the DMCA is basically to stop people from sharing, and both of those parts of the DMCA serve the purpose of stopping people from sharing. I believe sharing copies of published works should be lawful and any law designed to stop that, any law against that, is an attack on society. So if the goal is to, to divide people and stop them from sharing, well DRM certainly contributes to that goal. Is the, is the DRM really harmful for an independent society? For an independent what? Society. Well, I don't know. For an in, I'm not sure what it means for society to be independent. Uh, I can't give a precise meaning to that. Could you say that in different words? How about a society which is not controlled by a select few companies? Oh, well, DRM tends to increase the control by of certain areas of society by companies and especially large companies. You see, a truly effective DRM scheme typically involves uh, getting everyone to follow the same standard to restrict people so that there are no exceptions. They need something like a monopoly. If there were effective competition, competition between uh, systems and practices that are diverse, then people would find ways to get copies without DRM. But what happens instead is a DRM conspiracy is set up whereby all the publishers start using although they're supposedly competing and may in fact be competing in some other sense in regard to their use of DRM they're all the same so just about everyone publishing recorded videos at one point switched to DVDs the DVDs were designed to have DRM it's all the same DRM system and they were all basically the same player system and so uh, that makes it, it means that basically cons competition does people no good. If you're someone who hates DRM, you can't find a publisher that's publishing the same things but without DRM. They're all doing, they're all restricting you the same. So if you are 
completely firm in your hatred of DRM, like me, you say, well, I just won't buy any such thing. But if you're not so firm, you'll probably surrender and go along with the restrictions of the system that they've switched to, which at that time meant DVDs. And then uh, because people had found ways to break the DRM of DVDs, uh, another sort of monopolistic system for DRM was designed, and that was Blu-ray discs. And you'll notice that all sorts of video publishing companies started publishing on Blu-ray discs. Well, that was one single technical standard with the same DRM. And they all used the same DRM implementing disc players for Blu-ray discs. So uh, they can they have a chance of success when they avoid comp competition. If there were enough competition, some publishers might start saying, hey, we'll publish without D DRM. My understanding is you can't write a Blu-ray disc that doesn't have DRM. You can't make, I w I've been told, you can't make and sell Blu-ray discs that anyone can copy. And that was one example of a change for the worse compared with DVDs. You can write DVDs that don't implement the DRM. What are some of the ways DRM mistreats the users without them actually knowing about it? Well, DRM, when DRM mistreats you, you'll, you'll notice. You know, uh, if you can't copy the contents into a file on your disk, you'll notice. So there are many malicious things that programs can do to users without users knowing. For instance, spying on users. It could have a back door. And unless you notice the use of the back door, you can't tell. But DRM is one thing that you can tell. How, according to you, should the laws concerning intellectual property should be applied to software and digital copies of media? But uh, I'm afraid that question is fundamentally confused by use of the vague overgeneralization, quote, intellectual property, unquote. Are you talking about patent laws? No, I'm talking law specifically for intellectual property protection. Uh, sorry, you don't understand. The term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, is applied to many different kinds of laws. For instance, patent laws. When you ask that question, whether you know it or not, you're asking about patent laws. That term is also commonly applied to trade secrecy. So whether you know it or not, your question is asking about trade secret law. And it's also applied to trademarks, which really just, you know, those are just names. Uh, and the trademark law just says what, that you can uh, register a trademark and then other people can't call their products by that name. So whether you knew it or not, your question was asking about those laws too. There are also plant variety monopolies, which uh, are not the same as patents. And you were asking about those those laws too. And there is also copyright law. Uh, so with, whether you knew it or not, you were asking about copyright law. And there are others, I don't even know what all of them are because there's so many and they're all different. And you were asking about all of those laws at once because you said, quote, intellectual property, unquote. I recognized about 20 years ago that that term, quote, intellectual property, reliably causes confusion because it asks about so many different laws at once 
and these laws are totally different they apply to different areas they have different purposes they're so in other words they're designed to achieve different things but that term quote intellectual property unquote treats them all as if they were all minor variations of the same thing and they're not so every time you use that term you're causing yourself to be confused and other people who think your question or statement is meaningful will get confused too so I decided to reject that term completely because I want people to understand the differences between these various laws and they can't understand that until they realize that these laws are different so please for the sake of having uh, meaningful answers please don't use that vague term and I hope in the future if anyone tries to use that vague term with you that you'll ask hey, which law are you actually talking about here uh, I wrote an article, it's gnu.org slash philosophy slash not dash IPR dot HTML, which explains this confusion and why if you want to think clearly, you must avoid thinking in terms of that term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. Can you try to make your question clear, specific enough that I could answer it? So if I were to rephrase the intent of this question, there are a lot of companies which try to hide behind these IP laws in order to protect the software. No, 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 no. For that's they they may try to they okay they hide behind the term quote intellectual property unquote to avoid making to prevent it from becoming clear which law they're talking about and what the issue is in the case but actually to speak of quote protecting software unquote there's another uh, sneaky point there what does it mean to quote protect software unquote prevent it from being destroyed prevent it from being erased protect normally means to protect something means to stop it from being destroyed or damaged or ruined so for instance if somebody threatens to break a DVD well a DVD of software that would and you stop the person from destroying the disk that would be protecting software right that's protecting software by the usual meaning of the word protect but using the term protect when in that kind of question when they say protect it's bogus uh, so I would say to them what do you mean by that what exactly is the thing you're trying to stop I would refuse to take up the intentionally confusing terminology like protect software I would insist on getting a concrete description of what you're trying to do and then I could give a concrete response do you want to give a concrete description of course you're quoting the other others you're not you're not saying that this is your goal you're talking about others who say that this is their goal and if they're speaking gobbledygook well you can't tell what they really mean uh, I'm saying that when they use that terminology they are basically confusing people it's gobbledygook it's not a real question and I would refuse to try to engage with their gobbledygook I talk about concrete questions that I can describe like should anyone be able to stop you from making a copy of something say to give it to me and if you want we can make it more concrete than that but you'll have to say which concrete case you mean the point is I don't believe that anyone should have the power to stop you from making a copy to give to your friend or to somebody you just met and uh, if somebody wants to try to argue 
for that we should give per that power well it's uh, the onus is on per to uh, demonstrate why person should have that power by the way I'm using gender neutral singular pronouns I reject the use of quote they unquote as a singular pronoun it's a plural pronoun A person who paid for a tool owns it and is used to modify it as they wish. For example, you do not like the color of the chair, paint it. If your car's tire is flat, paint it. Or ask a machine to help you with that. Except in yeah. many cases where there is a computer and usually a software involved. Yeah. Well, I think you should have the same freedom to change the software. And that relates to the issue of free uh, Mukt or Swatantra software. I have fought for free software because I believe all users who are running programs should have the freedom to change those programs or get someone else to help change them. And that's why I've developed free programs and released them to give other people that freedom. And that's why I refuse to run non-free programs because they subjugate their users by stopping the users from changing those programs. It means that the users don't have control of their own computing. I consider that unacceptable, so I don't accept it. I simply say I won't use that, soft, that non-free software. Take it away. But why is computer software treated differently than other tools? For example, if you take the case of John Deere tractors. Of what did you say? Oh, John Deere tractors, you yes. said. Yes. Yeah. Well, do you, say, do you want a legal reason or a moral reason? Moral preference. Oh, well, morally, it shouldn't be. Morally, all software should be free. Users should always get the source code and they should be able to change it and publish modified versions so that others can get the benefit of their changes. How now, I can, yeah, I, can I can tell you practically speaking why it is not treated the same way. It's because software was treated as a kind of written work. Written works were covered by copyright law. They generally were not tools of any sort. Uh, you looked at them. You didn't. You didn't pick one up. You didn't pick up a written work and and turn something with it. Right? It's not a tool in the same sense as a screwdriver is. And physical structures were treated legally different from collections of text which is what a program is and so carrying forward those two uh, existing practices they ended up saying that programs were copyrighted and at this point uh, the lobbying of the companies uh, some of which were already large in the 1980s uh, was enough to cause copyright law in the US to be interpreted in rather strange ways for software. For instance, uh, companies started saying this program is copyrighted and it's a trade secret. Now it used to be that copyright applied to published works and anything that's a trade sec that's a secret is not published. If it were published it wouldn't be a secret anymore. But the companies lobbied and they got they were allowed to have it both ways. They could say the source code is a secret and the compiled executable is uh, published. And so they could have the benefit of copyright law and trade secret law for the same work at the same time. Now, if, you, if the people writing the laws had been thinking based on what is in the public interest they might have said that's absurd but they were thinking about how can I please these companies that will give me a job later 
you know once I'm not in office anymore I want to get paid by companies so they did things to please the companies which probably told them we'll have work for you later this is no that system is known as the revolving door between business and government and it's fundamentally a form of corruption even though it's not necessarily illegal but morally speaking it's corruption it is rather, so it so is what rather. we ended up with well so we ended up with software with software that was copyrighted and the source code was secret and thus the company had two ways to restrict the users of that program one was they couldn't get the source code so they couldn't change it really uh, except by patching the binary and that's hard to do it's hard to make a very big change by patching the binary uh, and at the same time it was copyrighted so they were forbidden to uh, redistribute it and if they so if they managed to patch the binary they were not allowed to share that with anybody else and so the users were helplessly under the power of that company that was the situation in the uh, early 80s which led me to develop free software and start the free software movement And meanwhile, non-free software led to DRM. You see, in order for a program that's intended to restrict users to succeed in restricting users, it has to be secret. If they can, or else there has to be something that stops the users from changing it and stops them in some other way. Because, you know, if if someone puts some uh, shackles on you uh, and you can then change the shape shape of the shackles so you can take them off your feet they're not really effective shackles are they is there a bird there yes not inside the home next to my oh. there is a tree oh it's nice to listen to You see, this is rather odd that a car manufacturer never stops the users from opening the bonnet and check what is underneath or even change it. Well, yes, actually, with software, they do exactly that. And that's basically what John Deere is doing with the tractors. Because now there are computers in the car or the tractor, and the computers are running software the software is an important part of the car or the tractor and that's what the supposed owner can't change so when you see that you get to see the evil of non-free software and uh, I don't think they should be allowed to sell cars with non-free software in them I think that they should be required to make the software free so users can change them change the programs what changes to the current system do you propose well that's rather complicated I you can find that in an article well it's actually a speech transcript and it would be close to the end or sort of the middle to the end where I talk about uh, the changes I propose in laws and the system of distributing uh, for, uh, for the legal system for publication basically I think all software should be free free is in freedom of course I don't mind if you charge money for a copy but the software that you distribute should always respect users freedom however I am against making it a crime to distribute a non-free program simply because criminalizing such things tends to fail to achieve its goal. 
I mean, look at, for instance, dangerous drugs that it's a crime to sell, but people just break those laws massively. And meanwhile, in the U.S., uh, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe more than a million, are in prison for breaking those laws, and yet people are still doing it in tremendous quantities. So that's the only reason I wouldn't want to make it a crime to distribute non-free software. But it shouldn't happen. For other kinds of works, however, uh, we have to look at copyright. And I would say that uh, works that are meant to serve a practical purpose, such as textbooks, for instance, or reference works, they should all be free as in freedom also. However, for other kinds of works, such as artistic works and works of uh, testimony, it's okay, it's okay for those works to be copyrighted, uh, but people should at least be allowed to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. So you should be allowed to be a good member of your community, which includes, among other things, making copies and sharing them. You know, if you have a copy of something and your friend says, hey, could I have a copy of that? Of course you will want to share a copy. That's the friendly thing to do. What do you think of DRM actively trying to stop the right to repair? Well, the right to the right to repair is basically a small part of the freedom that free software gives. So, of course, I support the right to repair, and anything that uh, works against it is wrong. But I would go much further than the right to repair. I would say the software in your car, your tractor, or your radio, or whatever it might be, should be free software. And that basically that provides the right to repair because it means that the users of the product can study how it works and they can extract the knowledge needed to do the repairs and share that knowledge you know write it down publish it and that way all the users of the product will be able to repair it What do you think of the companies today leasing their products or services as per the EU law and abusing DMCA and DRM to prevent the consumers from having control of the things they own? Well, uh, I couldn't hear the beginning. Did you say leasing? Yes. Well, because these are two different things. Now, leasing a product... Uh, me, if if so, if a company leases a product to you, then you don't own it. However, I would say that if you have the possession of the product for the long term, that's enough reason why the software in it should be free. So you should be free to change that software. Of course, maybe someday you terminate the lease and you return the product and they probably will restore the standard software inside it before they lease it to someone else. Uh, when I say product slash services, I meant the so-called software as a service. Oh, software as a service is a, it's too vague a term to mean anything. It's of interest perhaps to uh, businesses for thinking about their strategies but in terms of how they're treating customers it's too vague it doesn't mean anything so it's not you could call it 
service as a software substitute. Oh, that's different, you see, though. That is a much more specific term. It doesn't cover as many different cases, and that's why I use it. Because it's more specific, it's narrow enough that I can say something coherent about it. I can't really say anything about, quote, software as a service because it's too broad, it's too varied. Service as a software substitute, I can say something about because it is less varied. It means that the service consists of running a certain program for you. And my response is, don't let someone else run it for you, run it yourself. If it's a free program and you run it yourself, you have control over it and that's the way it should be if it's a free program but you pay someone else to run it for you then you don't really get control over what that program is doing because it's running in a, someone else's computer of course if it's a non-free program then even if you run it yourself you don't really have control you don't have control over what it does but you're closer to you, you have more control if you were running it than if someone else is running it. You, I think you may have noticed that often I reject the basic concepts that are used by the typically accepted con, uh, views and stands of business. It's not, I wouldn't just say I disagree with that statement. I would disagree with the, with the concepts it's formulated in terms of. What kind of bird is chirping there? I believe it's a sparrow. Oh. So, so what do you mean when you say you own well with free software with free software when you get a copy you own it the same way you could own a chair you buy a chair you own it with a free software you buy a copy you own it but with consider for instance uh, some software package you might think that you're buying a copy but the company will say you don't own it you just have a license to you to run it under limited terms well I think that that is mistreatment of the public that's part of the reason why I won't ever use that software what are the minimum set of rights an owner must have well, owner, that's too vague a question. Owner of what? What's the scenario here? We are talking about software. Okay. What are the set of rights an owner of a software must well, have? What do you mean by owner of a program? Uh, do you mean the developer? Do you mean a user? Anybody who bought the software. Oh, okay. Software so, first of all, well, I would say since we're talking about the user of a program that software should be free and that means that the user any user gets the four essential freedoms freedom zero is the freedom to run the program however you wish for whatever purpose you have in mind freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of that program so they've got to give you the source and then change it so it functions the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others. And freedom three is the freedom to uh, make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others. You talk about reselling. Now, it is completely okay if I had to resell a vehicle. Yeah. But in case, if it came with a software, let's take example of Tesla. Oh, well, please, please be careful. Please be careful. When you res, we're not, 
we're using the term re, re, you're using the term resell which is not a term I used what I said is the freedom to make copies and then give the or sell those copies to others now that's not reselling in the usual sense of that word because what I'm talking about in, involves making more copies with a free program you have the right to copy it and give or sell the copies you also have with a free program you have the right to change the code and then copy that and give or sell copies so this is a rather firm stand it's not the same thing as you bought a car and you sell the same car to somebody else should that right also be protected for the free software well what do you mean by protected i don't that's a strange choice of word to use if i, if I get a copy of the software yeah. should i be allowed to give that copy to someone else permanently let's say i bought it on a dvd night and i give the dvd to someone else me not having the copy at all well i that i expect is is lawful nowadays although there are some that will try to make you sign a contract and won't let users get copies without that and that is an additional level of oppression but i'm going far beyond that i'm not just saying you should be allowed to resell the same copy i'm saying you should have the freedom to copy it to make more copies are you sure that bird isn't a parrot yes i am okay sure. yeah so while we are speaking about uh, selling the exa uh, the copy itself now consider this the amazon kindle it comes with the account tied to the amazon account if i were to give it to someone else the books would not transfer well that's it that's one of the injustices of drm this is one of the reasons i would never use an amazon ebook and i never have no company should know what books you have no company should be able to stop you from uh giving those books or selling those books to someone else and if the book is digital that means it is possible to copy it so uh no company should be able to stop you from non-commercially copying and redistributing those books if if you had a, if you have a book and I would like a copy of it and you wish to copy it you should be allowed to copy it for me you shouldn't have to but if you feel like do you know it might be a lot of trouble and you'd say I'm sorry I'm too busy but if you want to do it and suppose it's easy then you should be allowed to do it so I'm not just against the specific method which is DRM I'm against the goal it is ostensibly meant to achieve that goal shouldn't be achieved by anything people should be free to share why do you think the EULA exists oh well you mean why do companies impose EULAs on programs yes, yes. well they want to restrict people they're trying to subjugate users they have many ways of doing that I have never agreed to any EULA no, the analogy that I prefer for DRM is think of a car that you just purchased the seller tells you that if it breaks down come bring it to me and I'll fix it for you one day you realize that it's not working turns out the exhaust pipe has some uh, blockage in it and if you try to uh, fix that 
now the seller tells you just because you did that now not only i'm not going to fix if the car breaks down i won't even let others fix it for you i would say moreover i don't think they are similar moreover, they're not really analogous um i would say that uh that restriction on a car is comparable to the restrictions on proprietary software regardless of DRM you know any non-free program because uh, typically it's impossible for you to fix it because they don't give you the source code even if you uh, are an authorized user you can't have the source code for most non-free programs the source codes not released at all so you can't fix it yourself now these these various situations they're related but they're not closely analogous they're not the same thing going on in these different fields they're often somewhat different and both evil but not in exactly the same way how has the software distribution changed over the decades that's too big a question sorry it's specifically in the rights that the oh had. well, non-free software started to exist. I th in the 1960s, at least maybe in the 1950s, but in the 1970s, free software almost ceased to exist. All the software, with small exceptions, was proprietary, non-free, and it was in the 1980s that I launched the attempt to uh, re-establish free software and to liberate users. What are the problems with the DMCA 1201, which is circumvention oh, of... Well, that, it, basically, the, the worst part of that is the complete prohibition on distributing things that tools that can break DRM so for instance anything that could access the video on a DVD or a blu-ray disc uh, is forbidden unless that unless uh, some company gives permission for it I'm not sure which company is allowed to give permission for it but basically you can't get permission for that so it has to be an underground device uh, one that is uh, circulated uh, without permission a forbidden tool what are the modifications that you would propose for the DMCA laws Regarding I would eliminate them entirely. I might make, I might what go further. Yeah, I would go further and say that making or selling or leasing or importing, put it as a making, importing, selling or leasing any product with DRM is a crime is the free software foundation, the free software foundation sf conservancy and the electronic frontier foundation aware of and working with any senator i don't sponsor i don't know what those other organizations are doing i don't think the free software foundation has contacts so high in government you know opposition to anti-circumvention existed around 20 years ago but it mostly got crushed what happens is most people will not continue to oppose the law 
once it has existed for some number of years it's too easy for people to say well we lost that one now what battle are we going to fight but people like me we never give up DRM is evil and since I will never accept a copy of anything with DRM I have to fight against DRM What are some of the ways a digital publisher can sell copyright? Please, 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 the words you're using, I will not accept. I'm not going to answer that question because to do it, I would have to accept the concept of piracy and the, co and the concept of protected. And I will not. I refuse to use them. When, peop when they say piracy, what they mean is sharing. It's a smear term to insult people who share. I will not smear sharing. I think sharing is good and stopping people from sharing is evil. Now, I, when they say protected, what they really mean is restricting. And I think that's bad. However, I am in favor of supporting artists better. The existing system changes so as to support artists less and less. Now this has become a scandal in the field of music as the streaming disservices pay musicians so little when streaming their music that the musicians are basically going broke. And what this shows, by the way, is the hypocrisy of the copyright system, which ostensibly exists to support the artists, but in fact it supports businesses that screw the artists. Well, instead of trying to fix that system, I say let's replace it and in the article in the page I told you about uh, copyright versus community HTML I propose two different two alternative systems to support artists so take a look at it how many more questions are there it's been almost an hour I've got to stop soon There are a few. Should we continue no, I, it in the next call? Let's I can't give you hours of my time. I just have so much work to do. Pick two really important questions, and then and let's do that. How do you think the browsers are affected by implement by W3C allowing means to exist? Uh, you mean allowing DRM in browsers? Uh, well, basically, what that means is uh, free browsers cannot support the entire web standards. The DRM is something that only non-free browsers can do. So you have to decide, do you want freedom? Or do you want to surrender to DRM and access the DRM covered works? For me, the choice is clear. I won't accept a copy of a DRM infected work. But the danger is that uh, is will we be able to keep free browsers going at all? I believe in the announcement Fire, uh, Mozilla mentioned how they had to choose between either supporting DRM or otherwise giving up on the... User. Yeah, well that's basically, that's how these schemes are set up. Uh, most users don't understand freedom. They have superficial short-term desires. They want to get copies. So if a cons if a conspiracy of publishers and that's effectively what it was although people don't like to think of it that way 
if a conspiracy of publishers says we're all going to publish using this scheme to restrict you so if you want to get anything from of the kind of work that we publish DRM will be your only way uh, people will say all right we'll accept the DRM and then they push browser developers like Firefox and stores and so on into uh, handling the DRM subjugated tools and products except for people like me who say no thanks I don't want any of those at all ever Was the GPL version 3 rather too late to prevent the... I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. Although, of course, we don't know what would have happened if history had been different. You can only speculate about that. Is there any scenario where DRM is morally and ethically... Not that I can imagine. The users should be... First of all... DRM means non-free software designed to stop people f from doing things with with the with copies of published works. And I don't think users should be stopped from copying and changing and sharing published works. For for art they don't have to be, I don't think users have to be permitted to distribute modified versions but they must be for, permitted to non-commercially share copies and DRM always prohibits that are you aware of snaps and flashbacks that are used to install applications on I've heard of it and I know that they can be used to install non-free software which of course it's a it's foolish to do you shouldn't trust a non-free program but yes you can install non-free software that has always been true and the reason is with free software ultimately you can do whatever you want there's no way to stop you so a free operating system always permits you to install non-free programs. The applications which would otherwise be available in the distribution repository, now the software developers are just moving to snap. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. It's a foolish thing. It's hard to trust the, these snaps and flat packs. And not only that, uh, those platforms distribute non-free software so it's a bad idea to point to them at all and in addition it means that uh, there aren't multiple you, you know with with distributions as distributions package a program they will look at the program and thus they're and, and they can fix things if they see anything bad they can change it and thus this is part of how users collectively maintain their control I've never installed a snap or a flat pack and I don't think I want to I wouldn't I don't trust it how do I know whether that flat pack includes some non free software how could I check I don't think they're designed to let people check they're not designed for anyone to be able to build the program as far as I know I could be mistaken but if all everybody does is just install the binaries in the flat pack nobody's building it how does anybody know if the complete source is available As a final question, what do you think of Ben Franklin? Sorry, what, what, what? Those who oh, I see. You're reading this. I couldn't hear you, but uh, I don't use that that quote. And the reason is, it's basic. in the context where he wrote it, it was talking about a different kind of issue. 
uh, and in any case, I think everybody deserves both liberty and safety. But how well does it? I, as I said, I don't. I understand what I understand the point that you're trying to make, but I, I value freedom and I value safety. But I wouldn't say that if you give one up, then you don't deserve it. I would say you made a foolish mistake. I would suppose suppose you make a foolish mistake that causes you to lose liberty and also be mistreated so you lose safety does that mean you don't deserve liberty and safety no in my opinion you deserve liberty and you deserve safety but you made a foolish mistake so you lost them I'd say you deserve to get them back Aren't the governments trying to say that the surveillance is for the safety? Why well, the yes, they government? say that. I don't believe it's really true. I think we are less safe when surveillance is going on because the tracking of us will be used for systems that mistreat people. When governments become too powerful, they become dangerous. And uh, surveillance, massive surveillance, tends to go with a dangerous government, and India is clearly an example of that. After all, we can't trust all the governments. Well, it's easier to trust a government that doesn't have quite so much power over people. We need governments to be able to do things, to establish policies, to set up systems, for instance, systems to tax the rich and do things that are good for everyone and do things to help the poor. But that doesn't require tracking everybody all the time. In fact, usually that doesn't require tracking anybody that much. I need to say I I need so to say goodbye. Me. This is too much. I'm sorry. That is what I was about to uh, say. That is what oh. I was about to say. As a final thought, to wrap up this uh, interview, what would you say? How the copyrights should now be? How effectively should they be changed? Should what change? The copyright well, law. as I said, in that article, Copyright versus Community, which you can find in gnu.org slash philosophy, I address that very topic. So I'm Thank happy you, hacking Tom. then. Yes. Happy hacking. Bye.